Okay. So I am uh, Monique Rambastien, coming from France, uh, Lorraine University. Um, as Janet, I am a, a retired professor. I'm emeritus now, <laughs> uh, but I'm still working um, not really on research, but much more on uh, synthesis and um, uh, activities uh, like that. So I'm very happy to, to be here, very honored to have been invited by the organizers. And I will share with you um, an ongoing work. Uh, so the, um, the talk will be slightly different from the others. Uh, I am sharing with you a kind of synthesis, but not a synthesis of what's going on today, a synthesis of the process by which we are here today. So it's not back to, back to the future, it's back to the past. And uh, we are trying to analyze what happened and how we came, we come, uh, where we are. Uh, my presentation, so I will give you the sources for this presentation, and then uh, I will divide into stabilities, it will be quickly done, <laughs> and um, the main evolutions from the beginning of the, of the field. Um, it was a bit difficult for me to organize the, the presentation of the evolution, and finally, I have chosen to propose what is evolving in the four components that we are talking about uh, from this morning and through additional functions and services but you could also say uh, from several dimensions uh, and then uh, some take home, uh, take home messages. So the origin of my presentation is the following. Um, the uh, IOD Society um, celebrated its uh, 25th anniversary and uh, for, for that the, uh, the chief editors decided to um, uh, build uh, special issues of the journal, one devoted to uh, a review of the past and I will uh, come on uh, later and the other one asking for future directions. So I was involved in the issue number one and um, it was built in the following way. Uh, the people that, uh, the, the papers, the author of the papers that were the most seated with the uh, automatic indexes um, were asked to provide a kind of update of their research. So uh, the papers are starting from uh, uh, 90, yes, to 90 to 2010, okay? So 20, 20 years of papers, uh, 40, 45 papers I think were selected and finally we ended with um, 20, uh, 35 papers. Um, the, one of the objectives was to uh, facilitate the access to uh, what I call old papers and uh, Going, giving the pace of our technology, some of them could be called uh, prehistorical papers, but anyway, uh, they contain some interesting uh, points. And another idea was to, be, to build or to rebuild an updated corpus of texts uh, instead of the, the scattered uh, previous publications. And another important, po important point was to encourage reflection, insights, uh, on the, the work that have been done. Very often when you publish the results of a research, you are still completely uh, inside the research and, and you cannot look uh, at more, uh, some important points compared to, to other, uh, to what we have done, to other research, to other labs, to society uh, uh, evolution and the like. So, uh, one of the questions was what happened to uh, the approaches and the systems you have built and how do you explain that as the, this feedback um, successes, failures and evolutions. And uh, once this uh, call for papers was uh, launched, the uh, process was well, the normal process of building a special issue in a journal, I mean uh, um, co-editors and then uh, three reviews, uh, three peer reviews for uh, each paper. Uh, the co-editors team was quite uh, well balanced, two uh, ladies and two men and from all over the, the world. 
Um, my co-editors were um, Rose Luckin in the UK, uh, Vincent Alevin in the US, and uh, Richiro Mizoguchi from Japan. So we did this work uh, all together. What, hap what are the, the stabilities that came, that come from the uh, first ITS models. Before going to those stabilities, I insist on the fact, do not forget the techni technological context. That's one of the difficulties for newcomers or for young people if you read old papers, because um, you cannot even imagine that internet, you know, was not existing to <laughs> two bars. Um, this is the first mouse. Um, it was a, an apple. This is nice. Okay. And um, all the, the systems that were built at that time were uh, intended to be used alone on a standalone computer, no networks, nothing. Um, I have learned programming with those punched cards, you know, but, but many of you don't know that. And um, here's an example of um, an existing system. Uh, well, I would say a load fashion interface uh, because it was not possible to, to design something else at, at that time. So when you read a paper uh, from those um, years, you have to take that in mind because if you don't have that in mind, well, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, I also want to explain roughly speaking, it's very roughly speaking, uh, what happened at the very beginning. At the very beginning of uh, the field of ITS, um, well, artificial intelligence researchers meet uh, educational researchers, cognitive science researchers. Uh, the, the first one of uh, technology, uh, and they were uh, thinking that it was applicable to education. And the other one, uh, got uh, progress in cognitive sciences, in uh, learning theories, and also there is a societal need, uh, more and more students, the, uh, the need for proposing new solutions and uh, like that. Okay, so when you look at the, um, at the subjects of the first system that are listed here, you understand that many people, at the beginning at least, were uh, experimenting their systems uh, in programming, in mathematics, troubleshooting, but also some, uh, some other things. Uh, medicine was also a well-explored domain. Okay, so what do we keep from those uh, first systems? Well, we keep the four-component model that was uh, shown by uh, Roger this morning. But I take it as an abstract model. So don't say uh, we will have uh, four modules uh, to, to implement the system. No, what we keep now is an abstract model because it's quite useful to say we have those four components, for four uh, types of knowledge, four types of reasoning processes, and we will try to organize them. Um, Again, the, the last one, the last historical one. At, at that time, um, there were uh, people, uh, they got brains, and uh, some of them got very good brains, and they were able to uh, provide first synthesis of, the, uh, of those models and of the systems with the, the four modules. So, of course, I wouldn't advise all the PhD students to read <laughs> the, the, those books, but anyway, they are uh, uh, well the, the main uh, basic books. And if the people were able to write books, uh, it means that well the the concepts were already uh, elaborated because you, you don't write a book complete book when it's not ready. So the stabilities four categories of knowledge and associate reasoning processes. Um, I insist, uh, but I think the other speakers did the same, about the fact that there, there is no reasoning, no intelligent behavior without knowledge. So we, we, I will focus on knowledge as well as on reasoning. 
the domain knowledge goes on including expert knowledge, but many other uh, important things for teaching and for learning. Um, I've written here, yeah, expert knowledge, well, right, but at the student level or not? And um, we have, uh, the, it was really true in the first systems and we, we keep that, uh, that idea because uh, we need to really at the, at the student uh, level. Um, I, some associated knowledge could be uh, added and was added from the beginning, for instance, in some uh, fields such as chemistry or mathematics, you need to use graphical representations uh, that we, you add to the real domain model because when you teach and when you reason, you, you need those graphical representations. And another thing that was from the beginning too is that students make mistakes. If they didn't, uh, they wouldn't be there for learning. And um, one of the solutions uh, was to um, build buggy models. I mean, the, 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 type, of re the type of reasoning uh, mostly used, of course it's not a panacea, but mostly used by uh, beginners. Tutoring knowledge was said uh, in previous uh, talks it's about the decision rules for, for feedback to students. Uh, there are usually two, two levels that are characteristics of the, um, of the tutoring system. One at the task level when you are solving a problem and the other one for shifting from one task to another one, providing a new task to the student. And the student knowledge. Uh, with um, the difficulty that it should be dynamically updated because if the student knowledge does not move, it's not a good sign for your system. Uh, and if you want to, um, uh, to adapt to your students, you have to, to manage this evolution. For each kind of, skull, uh, of knowledge, you have several different reasoning processes uh, and um, so you have to mix all that and in one system usually you have several knowledge representations and you have several uh, reasoning processes. That was for the beginning. What's changing? There have been very important evolutions and I will uh, distinguish two uh, dimensions changes in learning objectives and changes in technology. Changes in learning objectives, the, the, the figure which is, who knows this, uh, this um, uh, figure? It's, uh, it's from Jules Verne and it is what was his, his expectation about learning in 2000. The idea, so the, the objective was to pick up all the knowledge that were in the book, put them in a machine, and then it will come immediately in the uh, student's brain. Well, that was an idea, but the learning objectives are not those ones today, <laughs> okay? And then about technology, I will come on, but uh, I have a small robot that uh, was at a nice conference. Um, and so those evolutions resulted in renewed contents for the four modules and additional functions and services for uh, better systems. So, um, this is an example, but I have to say that the papers, the, the 35 papers that were published, they were published in the Artificial Intelligence and Education Journal at the beginning of 2016. They were built in 2015 uh, and it was foreseen to publish in 2015 because it was the 25th anniversary, but uh, of course we were late and uh, it came at the beginning of, the, of this year. So the, 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 the authors have um, interpreted the, uh, the request very differently. But some of them, uh, in terms of historical presentation, did a very good job. And, and I took an example, you see, that here they, they show their previous tutor, the, the first one, and then they show how it evolved over, over the years. And at the beginning, they, they give their, uh, within their research input, 
one about technological uh, technologies for conversational tutoring. They were one of focus. Another focus was on uh, research. They were observing human tutoring. And the third focus was to using pedagogical agents and, and working on that. And they show how these ideas evolved uh, over time. Some other, some other authors um, did the same, but not in a, not in a, in a figure, just uh, in the text. And some others give just one sentence and they, they skip that, <laughs> that part. OK. About uh, new education theories and new ways of learning, uh, one thing that several points came very often, but uh, I, I took uh, four here. Uh, one point is about self-regulated learning. Uh, well, at the beginning or in the past, uh, many efforts were given to learning something, and now uh, the effort is more on um, learn how to learn, so self-regulated learning. Um, another point that's often underlined is the use of the uh, zone of proximal development. Of course, uh, Witkowski's work are very are older than that, but people try now to, to better integrate that in their work. Another, uh, the two other very, very important points. One, it's uh, the idea of my question to, to Beverly, uh, collaborative learning. Many, many of the systems evolved through, uh, towards collaboration. And another very important point is taking account of the importance of context. Or context is a big word, and you have several dimensions uh, on context. Could be a, a local context, it should be a peer time context, could be a cultural context, it could be an emotional context. But well, many, uh, many authors underline that the evolution is through taking into account the context. Given the, those points, uh, many authors have tried, I would say, new ways of learning. For instance, uh, learning from a knowledgeable agent, learning from reasoning, learning from teaching, learning from uh, uh, reflection. And that gave birth to, uh, to many different systems. Uh, that's uh, about theories of learning. As you have understood, I am from computer science and not from cognitive science. So I let the responsibility to people from cognitive science to, to say if it's a good point or not. But anyway, if you are interested in that, uh, it's coming from a European funded project called Hotel. But it, it's just to show that the, the, there are a lot of progresses and, and a lot of uh, avenues uh, in those uh, learning theories. Now, uh, our, that was the progresses in the, the main uh, driving lines about uh, learning. Here are some driving lines about technical opportunities. Of course, what happened, the uh, computing powers increased, increased, and increased. Uh, the computers are not standard computers. They are all networked. and and came the web. And many uh, papers are reporting that, well, the, the web is fantastic, but the web put the system down because it's completely another way of programming. And uh, many, many um, authors said, well, it was really for us a technical rupture. And uh, previous systems either were rebuilt or died. OK? And I think that from, from an historical viewpoint, it's quite interesting to consider that sometimes, from the technological viewpoint, you have ruptures that oblige you to rebuild the systems, and you can no more, while well, slightly evaluate from uh, time to time. OK? Um, after that came a lot of uh, Multimedia interfaces, tablets, smartphones, robots, uh, other devices, and then today the Internet of Things. Okay, um, the Internet so came, and and now we are uh, we are trying to manage the learning data, the, the big learning data, to try to um, use data mining techniques. Another in important point that comes from the technique, but that will goes to the societal. 
uh, it is uh, the social networks. At the beginning, the social networks was like that. It comes from a project uh, I was involved in uh, because um, the, there are many social networks, but usually they do not communicate one to the other very well. So, of course, it's social network, but there are all walls between them. But I think it, it will evolve. The other point I would like to underline before shifting to the next slide is the first, uh, the first image there. It is a technology, you see it's a, it's a pants for, for giving sun and power. And um, when we think about technology evolution, we are always interested in, in the last technology. But even if not really the role of uh, researchers, we have to think that the technology is not available, not yet available for everyone. And it reminds me um, uh, something that happened at the uh, beginning of the, the opening session of the uh, World Conference. Um, it was in Brazil, and the Brazilian Ministry of Education was there from the opening ceremony. And um, one of the participants uh, put a question and says, how oh, Mr. Minister, what are your priorities in Brazil in terms of uh, uh, educational technologies? And the answer was quite cold. Our priority is to provide electricity to our Amazonian schools. Okay, so I, I, I thought it was a very good point to remind to people, well, uh, everything is not uh, equal uh, everywhere, but well. Um, so now uh, we will see uh, what are the four components evolution and uh, I will take also this opportunity to tell you that the, in this community people are working and they are working well and so from time to time uh, people take the initiative of writing synthesis and here we, you have two books that could be useful for you. Uh, one was a, is a collection of, of papers uh, many authors are here, and the other one is a big job by Bev, who is here. Uh, so it's, uh, the one is more textbook, the other one is more a collection of um, position papers. Uh, okay, so let's begin with the domain models. Uh, what, uh, has, what is the evolution? The evolution is about much more knowledge representation. One is uh, worthwhile to be uh, underlined. It's the idea of constraints, representing the domain by constraints, and then using constraint-based ba constraint tutors. You have a, a nice work by uh, Tanya Mitrovic about that, and she published a lot of papers. Uh, same thing for the re reasoning processes. At the beginning, mainly uh, the reasoning processes were uh, Produ using production rules and, and uh, influencing new, new knowledge. Uh, after that, many other um, reasoning processes were used, for instance, uh, case-based reasoning, constraints-based reasoning, but also uh, probabilities and Bayesian-based uh, reasoning. The third point that has to be considered about the, the description of the domain knowledge is that we are no more in a standalone computer. And it's quite difficult today to stick to a very uh, closed domain knowledge description. So maybe I've written you, you leave maybe your closed knowledge base and you go, why not until DBpedia? And there are some attempts today to use DBpedia as the, the domain knowledge. For, it works better for some uh, domains than for others. But well, anyway, it, it's to be considered. Um, as there are more and more uh, knowledge representation needs, uh, something wise could be to share <laughs> domain models uh, in, the, in the form of ontologies. Uh, there have been huge, huge initiatives about that. The big one is the omnibus ontology. If you want to know about that, you see Jacqueline, which is a co-author about that. Um, but in fact, um, it has not been used a lot. Uh, what people have used, uh, shared, is uh, like light ontologies, more organized vocabularies. Uh, but uh, on that point, the sharing of knowledge representation, uh, expectations uh, were not reached, and a lot uh, begins, uh, remains to be done. And finally, 
um, the changes in domain models are often called under the, the expression ill-defined domains. Well, you can ask yourself why there are domains that are well-defined <laughs> and why uh, there are domains that are ill-defined, but it, they are called like that in the, in the literature. Um, examples, uh, database modeling. If, if you teach database modeling, you don't have one solution to a problem. You have a lot of solutions. So how do you model that by constraints? Um, if you want to teach metacognitive skills and not really skills, how do you model that? Uh, if you want to teach architecture. So um, there have been a lot of progresses made to model those domains for which it was not easy, not really intuitive to, to, to do that. Uh, no, this one. Uh, now, about the uh, learner, this is the second component, the learner model. Um, much work has been done with a focus of more personalization. So we got bias in networks, we got probability-based inferences, we got much more than the, the first overlay models. We completed that by context. We also completed that now, and uh, now we are, we are all aware about the affective states and uh, the kind of things we can infer from uh, physiological data. Uh, we shift to open learner model. At the beginning, the learner model was to uh, allow the system to work. And after that, people think about showing the learner model to the learner, to the teacher, and uh, using it. Uh, if, you, if you agree to open the learner model, you can uh, think about co-constructing the model with the learner. Uh, you can think about involving the learner in the diagnostic process and uh, those things like that. And same thing that for the domain model, if we are to have a lot of systems communicating the one with the others, it could be nice to have some standardized learner models. But again, on that point, it's progressing very slowly. Uh, at the international level, it's the uh, IMS consortium, which is in charge of that. But the learner models are very, very simple, <laughs> as you see here. And they are very far, very far from what we need uh, to have some uh, reasoning uh, on them. Now, uh, component number three, the tutoring module. Uh, what is the evolution? The evolution uh, is about teaching knowledge. Um, many authors, most authors, say that uh, you need co-design <coughs> with teachers when you build systems. It's the, one of the best ways to get uh, the, the, the knowledge and to uh, uh, work on it. Uh, so there are observations on how to implement uh, the similar behavior, observing the students, the, the students teachers dialogue, and uh, taking into account those new data as context, affective, emotional issues. Uh, there have been also changes about the cognitive diagnostic and uh, diagnosis. Uh, in a way that I, la I must say I like a, a lot, uh, the idea is splitting the task between a human tutor and the machine, and that could be, in my view, the, the right way to do the things. Take, let's take the machine for what it is useful, and uh, let us keep the humans for what they are good to do. Uh, new pedagogical approaches, uh, of course, need new uh, knowledge uh, representation. Uh, one interesting is uh, teaching the tutor, and uh, some system has be, have been built like that. Uh, your tutor, you, you teach a tutor. Your tutor is given exercises, and uh, as uh, as far the uh, exercises made by the tutor are is not good, are not good. Well, you are supposed to have uh, not teach taught your tutor uh, correctly, and that often means that you do not master the subject correctly. Of course, not 100%, but it is the hypothesis. And the final uh, changes that were uh, quite important and that were underlined by other talks is that tutorship become, becomes embodied. 
uh, pedagogical agents, virtual animated agents, who are um, humanoid robots. So that's another way of um, uh, showing uh, teaching knowledge, uh, not only text, but also using mimics, gestures, and why not emotional aspects of the, of the tutor. About user interaction, uh, well, it's uh, not so much about knowledge, but it's interesting to think about that uh, for um, feedback to, to students. And uh, I, I like a lot the suggestion made by Pierre Dillenburg about the le learning ski. He said, well, uh, well, when you are learning ski, you, you have a, a tutor saying, well, no, on the left, the left, on the right, uh, put yourself that way, put yourself that way. And he said, why don't have it directly feedback from the ski in, in, in your legs? So you will really understand very quickly that you should put the leg here or put the leg the other side. So it's an idea of um, new items that could be used for some kinds of learning uh, uh, that are not yet uh, widespread, but uh, well, that are ideas for, for the future. And I think I find that quite interesting. Um, this is an example of a system uh, that is not a tutoring system, but it's a good example of merging or mixing between two approaches. Um, it's uh, the system from uh, Peter Brusilovsky, and it comes from one side, hypermedia system. On the other side, kind of tutoring system, programming tutoring systems. And they merge both. An important point is that the system is still online. Uh, I'm not sure you are, uh, you are, it's a need for you to, to learn this function. It's a functional programming language that uh, many of you don't know probably. But anyway, uh, the interesting point is that at certain points of technological advances or conceptual advances, you will see the birth of new systems integrating uh, approaches that were, until that point, completely separated. Okay? Um, that are examples, and you, you, you get on the same screen the hypermedia book with the lessons and also the, uh, the average of uh, knowledge you already have, your, your level, and the, the, the learner level on each point. And on the other part of the, of the screen, you can uh, work on your exercises, so programming exercises, writing list function, and getting feedback uh, uh, about, your, about your work. Uh, that's the same thing. Now, uh, now we are finished with uh, an overview of the evolution of the four uh, modules, the four components. But a lot of things have been added uh, and they are transversal to the first module. That's why I put them here. Um, the order is random. So it's not alphabetic. It's not the importance of the thing. You can consider it's only random. First, the help. Many other speakers have talked about the help function. And uh, I agree with uh, what has, has been said. It's very important for self-regulating uh, learning to be able to demand help at the right time. So to have systems accepting that, of course. Uh, people, about Christina I certainly uh, could speak about that, uh, have tried coaching self-explanation. Uh, some others have tried getting students asked for hints, so it's a bit the, the same idea. But all this kind of request for help, in my view, should be revisited in the light of massive, massive tracks and uh, collaborative learning also. Um, peer help has been developed from many years, even if some very uh, I would say close, but the local system, I would say. And the first one that's uh, well-known is uh, the P-Help system by uh, people from Saskatoon, uh, Arias Lab. And they deployed it in uh, university courses, but of course at that time it was, it was limited to this uh, university. But in my view, 
uh, there are promising implications for, for MOOCs. Uh, help seeking also was uh, an important function, but today, uh, today peer help should be mixed. It, uh, it's another example of two uh, two strands that uh, two trend that could should be mixed. You have peer help on one side. You have the kind of tutoring help in the uh, individual tutors. In how can we merge? the two kind of, I, I would say, I would like to say three kind of help because you have the help, the online help, you have the peer help, but I would like we don't forget the teacher <laughs> or the tutor, the human tutor. So in fine, you, you are, you have to, the systems and the, and the learners and the, well, uh, everyone should be able to merge uh, adequately uh, the help provided by the systems, the help provided by the peers, uh, the, the present peers, but all the online peers, but also, why not, the help of the teacher. Uh, second, I write, I've written again here uh, something about the open learner models, because uh, we, we cannot say it, it's, it's a too big change, so of course we can think it about an evolution of the uh, first learner models, but it's more considered today as a, uh, a, a, real, uh, a, a real module per se. Um, the people that write a, write a lot about uh, open learner models are uh, Judy Kay uh, and uh, Susan Bull from the UK. And uh, they, they have written good sentences, but they have also um, proposed a, a big framework, smiley, smiley, I don't know if they say smiley, 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 someone knows well breath this one. Um, <coughs> that is interesting. Uh, it, it has never been used because it's, uh, it's very complete, so very complicated, but very complex. But it should be uh, very interesting if you, are, if you want to compare some learner models and if you, are, if you are, have the idea of completing uh, learner models, you can go to this framework and say, see the very dimension that could be considered. Of course, you will not consider all the dimensions. Um, the last point is uh, open learner models for supporting learning versus uh, for institutions. That comes from the MOOCs and the online uh, learning environments. Uh, many people want to get uh, knowledge from the data, uh, but uh, there are two different purposes. Uh, one is you really want the learner to learn. That's, I think, our common purpose here. But there are other purposes uh, that are coming from the uh, institution or the fund, financial funders. Uh, they want to know what happened um, only for managing reasons, not really for helping the learner at the right time. But, well, that is the story. Now, um, Enhancing user adaptation. Um, I think it's really the way we should go. It was the, uh, the, the goal at the beginning, but many things should be, uh, should be done uh, in that direction. Um, we talked about understanding the links between emotion and cognition. Uh, there were development about motivation tactics, so we, we talk about motivation this morning, it's, it's really uh, at the core of the, of the thing. Uh, why not uh, personalize tutors? Uh, 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 now in the online system such as MOOCs and others, um, you don't have uh, tutors or it's the same for anyone, or you have human people trying to look at the forum and to provide some personalized answers to the to questions that are raised, but usually it's uh, not uh, manageable because you have too many, too many people. Why not implementing uh, artificial tutors and personalized artificial tutors for the, the several uh, people uh, uh, attending the, the course? Uh, and uh, well, in terms of adaptation, you, do, you have also to think about adapting the uh, external representation, adapting the, the kind of feedback, could be gestural gestures, could be sound, could be written, could be images, depending on the, uh, on the learner. Big point, collaboration. 
Uh, today, I think it could be difficult to imagine a lonely student with an isolated machine. I've put a question mark because who knows, maybe in some century we go, can go back to that. But today, I think it's, uh, it's not correct. So, um, collaboration is a necessity. Uh, some authors um, took the, the point of negotiation. They start from their work, which is a negotiation about meaning in the context of uh, scientific dialogues, so one student explaining to another one uh, why this electronic circuit is uh, uh, working or not working. And the interesting point is that um, he noticed that over the years, uh, the underlying theories uh, change or light uh, or underline some new points. And they say they, they change from a cognitivist model of thoughts underlying dialogue to a view of dialogue itself as one manifestation of collective thinking. So that seems to be quite interesting because the, the same thing, uh, two students uh, uh, discussing on, on a problem uh, will be um, explained in terms of uh, cognitive uh, processes in a different way. And uh, the second way is the idea of collective thinking. So collaboration that was not at all present uh, maybe uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, same evolution for tutoring systems. Uh, Kurt Van Lane, like Caviel is for Kurt Van Lane, uh, in his paper, in his update, underlined that the evolution for him is toward uh, computer support, uh, coll uh, collaborative support and uh, learning. Uh, implementing the um, zone of proximal development, an interesting paper about that is the Ecolab system. Uh, and uh, it's the, they describe a very, uh, I would say, in terms of implementation, in terms of concepts, and in terms of um, educational goals, and also in terms of implementation in the system, uh, the, um, the, the way uh, they got first an approximate assistance, and this is uh, implemented by the, the resources that, were, that are available to the students, and then they go to a proximal adjustment with uh, selecting the resources that are, are more uh, accurately, uh, more accurate for the students. The students remain free to go to the, the world, but he is scaffolded by a, a more restricted set of resources, and it's a nice system. Another point. Uh, that is uh, underlined by some authors, not all, but uh, that is important in my view, is the question of offering, of offering systems. Some authors, uh, as a follow-up of their first publication, say, well, uh, in short, scaling, uh, scale, scaling up for our system proposal and the like was impossible because uh, building a, a, a system with our uh, environment was too, dif too difficult for, um, for pro uh, teachers. Okay, so one solution, it's not the, also the, the only one, but one solution uh, has been to provide an offering system over the, the first built system, and in some cases they were very successful uh, in proposing uh, authoring systems and uh, more teachers came and were able to build, uh, to build systems over that. Um, as example of generic tools, you have the uh, well-known example tracing tutors and uh, uh, they describe in the update, so it's a big update, uh, 25 tutors developed in, in very, uh, what's interesting is that it's very, developed in very different uh, domains. And you have also the, uh, over the, the conference-based tutors, uh, the, uh, also an offering environment uh, helping uh, the, the teachers to describe the, the conference and so after that to build the, the system. Um, another point uh, that is not so much taken into account uh, but that comes again very much important with the, the MOOC and online system in the assessment. 
assessment, there are two viewpoints. The first one is assessing the ITS system themselves. Um, there have been the first paper about that by Grieg and Mark, and uh, they say in their conclusion, well, no significant progress since that time. In fact, there have been some proposals. Uh, the one is to use simulated students to uh, evaluate a new system. Uh, the other one is to uh, use crowdsourcing. Uh, so that's one of the point. Another point is uh, the evaluation of the, 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 the learning of the student, maybe to deliver uh, credit badges and, uh, and any other certificates. And um, there are not so many people about, uh, so many um, well, people and systems about uh, automatic assessment environment. And uh, I've put the Seat uh, Spanish example because uh, about the about the reflection on the system, it's quite nice. They, they have written uh, 10 years after something that they, they would never have written at the beginning. They said, well, finally, uh, we have written this system to convince our colleagues in the university that using online systems could be really uh, interesting. And the way to convince their colleague was you, you will see it's nice to um, build automatic evaluations. And of course, when they describe the first paper, they say very uh, scientific things. Uh, uh, as Tom said last year, you, you never read in the papers that uh, the class was not the good, right one, that you were obliged to change for doing your experiment and the like. And, and it's a bit like that. It, it's rather funny to, to read the, the new introduction because they explain really what happened in their university, what was the situation at that time, and why they, they built the system. And, uh, and in, an important point is that their system is a domain independent. So it, it, worked, it was built to convince uh, colleagues in very different disciplines uh, for using uh, online systems. Uh, but about the evaluation, the, the big question today is uh, peer evaluation, of course. Um, well, so of course, there are many other uh, interesting ideas in the 35 papers, but uh, I have to stop uh, here and to go to some other classification. So um, the idea to keep in mind is that um, we have in uh, artificial intelligence and education uh, a, a legacy, and the legacy I've called uh, it's uh, supported by the, some success stories or some systems. And there are well-known systems. Uh, they are not all here, so if yours is not here, please don't be frustrated. <laughs> uh, but for people, uh, it's more an advice to PhD students, for people working in the field, it's useful to know at least a bit about those systems. And for that, reading the introductions of the new version of the papers could be nice for you. You, you have the, the summary of the, the, the system in uh, one page or half a page. So it's good for you. It's enough. You know the name of the system. You know what was the goal, what was the performance, the, the main results, and, and that's all. Now, where are we going? Uh, we still have a need for convincing people and for scaling up, and probably both are, li are linked. I got the uh, degree example for convincing people. Uh, about uh, scaling up, we, many years ago, we already have a paper entitled ITS goes to school in the big city. So it was an example of uh, uh, spreading the system, but if you look carefully, uh, you'll see that the that spreading is uh, 75 schools, which is quite a lot, but it's it stopped like that because uh, it was still difficult to um, to build or to evolve to having the system evolved by uh, school teachers. You know, so uh, when I um, Thinking about scaling up, I would dream about a uh, system that were available in several MOOCs to uh, all, the, all the people around the world. And uh, we are not yet there, but I think we should go and we could go there. 
But we have systems that are really working and that are widespread. And I put here the uh, system from um, Johnson and the, uh, the Alelo uh, system because there are, um, so someone I think already talked about the system. They are uh, training the people from the US Army uh, going to um, uh, Middle East. And they are training them uh, either on uh, language and on cultural aspects, the things to do and the things not to do, uh, how to behave in, the, in those regions. And uh, it was very successful and uh, it's uh, largely used. But they have also built systems, not only for the army, but also for people all over the world uh, willing to learn um, foreign languages. And those systems are also very successful. So in my view, that's a good example of a spreading of the system. Now the system are sold uh, and uh, the, the creator of the system has nothing to do with the users. Future trends. Well, of course, the MOOCs, the SPOCs, here you are calling them the clumps, I think, in the Quebec language. <laughs> um, well, of course, one trend today is to exploit the wealth of data that are provided by these environments and that our big ancestor never had uh, for their experiences and for testing th their systems. But, and um, I, have a, I am a, from computer science, but I'm sure that the, the big issue uh, is about understanding how people learn efficiently. And that's not a question of technology, that's not a question of big data, even if the exploitation of being big data could help. That's the question of um, uh, deepening the field and uh, trying to, to understand how they learn efficiently, depending on the background, depending on the context, depending on the learning goal, depending on the emotive state, and depending on many other factors. I have some message to take home. Message one, you have series in the field and they have to be known, uh, already, already detailed, but um, I think they implemented many facets of the ITS reasoning processes uh, that have been used to support human reasoning. Uh, those series are brought a significant part of uh, the ITS research legacy. And the third important point for me is that uh, when you look at the, the development of those systems and of their, their story as they are uh, uh, written by the authors, uh, you see that the good achievements uh, need duration. Very often they are talking about what happened during 10 years or during 15 years. They need cooperative work from human multidisciplinary teams. So we all have to keep in mind that they, these are necessary uh, reasons. Message number two. The history of ITS uh, is rich with principles, theories, concepts, models, whatever you want. Um, especially knowledge and knowledge uh, and reasoning representation issues. Uh, were also the subject of many valuable proposals. So please look at them or do not forget them. If you completely forget some issues and you write a paper for a conference, you will get as a feedback from your reviewer, please do not reinvent the wheel. <laughs> and that happened to me, uh, I think a couple of years ago. I read a paper from some probably young students applying prologue to uh, solving uh, an interesting uh, new tutoring uh, uh, system and they present that as something very new. Ah, we have a new idea. We use prologue for programming uh, tutoring systems. And I say, well, there have been a series of conferences. Uh, they were organized by our colleagues from UK and Scotland uh, in the past. So please um, look at them. Well. But uh, the previous thing are often uh, forgotten or hidden by the rate to fashionable questions, powering technologies, short-term results, and the like. 
Uh, do not confuse research activities and race for immediate announcement. The immediate announcements are for politicians. Uh, I know you, you, we have to negotiate with them to get money, but, but they are for politicians. Uh, you are scientists and uh, you, you have to, to come to deep uh, reflection and not to uh, immediate announcements. Message number three is the last one. <laughs> Uh, much has been achieved in the 25 years, but I don't want to say, I want to remind you with that because it's our legacy, but it doesn't mean at all that uh, things are, are done. In my view, there is an ever growing set of large avenues for new research opportunities, either in investigating uh, already, uh, already investigated questions or in launching completely new research questions. For instance, uh, what about the, the MOOCs and similar uh, online learning environments? Uh, what to do with the, uh, the, the massive use of the, the forum uh, that are used today? Uh, well, so uh, that's a, a message of, of hope to the, to the beginners. Uh, there are many things to do. And I've got an example to, before closing. Uh, I have an example uh, that, that is done, or well, currently do, be, being done, about the use of uh, natural language processing methods um, in, um, in, a MOOC, uh, in a MOOC. So this is an artificial intelligence course. Um, it is in Georgia Tech. Uh, is anyone here aware of what happened in the uh, artificial intelligence course, course in Georgia Tech uh, this semester? Yes, you know, so you don't tell me. <laughs> okay, she knows too, yeah, of course. No, <laughs> well. Okay, right, so yeah, I know, I know it. So this is, a, this is a page from the web also. But the story is the following. Uh, they are running a MOOC about a uh, basic course on artificial intelligence for several sessions. I think it is number five. And uh, the MOOC is run as uh, every MOOC. They have many students, uh, and they have five uh, human tutors that look at the, uh, at the forum and try to provide help and answers to the uh, student um, questions. And this year, they decided to have four human tutors and one artificial tutor. How did they build the artificial tutor? They uh, analyze with uh, natural language processing uh, techniques and statistic techniques. They analyze all they got in the forum during the first four uh, sessions. And with that, they prepare answers to most of the questions. And so the remaining, the remaining questions were for the human tutors, and they have much more time to concentrate their energy and their availability for those new questions, and all the other ones were taken by the um, artificial tutor. And for the student, it was, nothing was said, so the tutors have um, first names, uh, John, uh, Mary, uh, and the like, and uh, one tutor, maybe, uh, why not Robert? Robert is here, well, it's a human, but uh, maybe we have an artificial Robert there. And uh, at the end of the course, some Brian student find something a bit strange about the behavior of Robert. And they say, oh, we have a very good artificial intelligence uh, professor. They, are a big, we are, they have a big research team. Um, maybe, maybe they have some trick. They have put some trick in the course. So they, they went to discuss, I think, with the, 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 the teaching team. And in fact, well, they explain you, you know, this year you have uh, four human tutors and one artificial tutor. But for all the other people, it was completely uh, transparent. They never understood that, they, uh, that they, they are talking to an artificial tutor. So yes? My understanding of that was that the questions that the computer tutor answered were things like, where do I find such and such? Is that going to be on the test? I mean, they were logistics questions. They were not learning questions. Not so much semantic questions, yeah, but I... I they were, well, they were logistics questions, not questions about learning. So I think um, it's interesting and it's fun. 
it's a yeah. little early to say that the computer was actually you're right, but it's. Uh, I think they are. Uh, they are. Well, we are all on, on the right way. I think we, you, we can progress uh, leaving to the machine part of the task. And uh, I agree with you that this should go with more semantic, of course, on the domain. Uh, but uh, it will give more available time to the human tutors. And that's all. <laughs> I'll fully.